Hello everyone, I'm Greg Faulkner, pastor of Trinity Presbyterian Church, and I welcome you to this second town hall meeting on race. I'm very glad to welcome today once again, Dr. Kwesi Manu, uh, who is a physician, a wound care specialist, um, and um, I'm glad to also welcome Juliet Akori again. Uh, Juliet is a rising junior. Um, uh, in biomedical and remind me chemical and biomolecular engineering yes <laughs> uh, which is our is already more than i accomplished in my undergraduate degree is just saying that so julia we're glad for you to be with us again and then we welcome uh today for the first time to these meetings uh, uh juliet's older sister evelyn okori who has just gradu graduated from uh, pittsburgh university uh, and um, also in, in pre-med, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and you will be uh, beginning a master's program and then pursuing med school after that, correct? Yes. Thank you for joining us, Evelyn. Uh, some of you will remember that we had Pat and Jeff Weaver with us last week. Uh, uh, Pat was unable to be with us uh, this week. And I'm very sorry to say that we had some technical difficulties that prevented Jeff from being here. We were trying to work on that and that wasn't possible, uh, but we hope to hear from them at a future time. So thank you so much, Quasi, Evelyn, Juliet for being here. Um, I do wanna say thanks to Jenny Stark and Susan Bassnager who have helped take care of the technology for us. And as we begin, I wanna say that I'm very grateful to the three of you for being here. I think one of the things one of the things that uh, everyone shared with me after last week was that, um, or two weeks ago when we had the last town hall meeting was that um, these are very hard conversations. And I know that we're asking a lot of you to share with us painful experiences. And so many people in our congregation have asked me to thank you, have told me how grateful they are. So I wanna take this opportunity to say that um, we realize this is difficult and we appreciate you being with us and sharing your hearts with us. So last time we met, uh, we heard stories of your experiences of racism being in, in America, and we heard different generations. Uh, and that we heard how this is not a, just an old story from the past, but a story that goes from our past down to the present. Um, we have seen a lot of things happen in the last several weeks in the nation um, since the deaths of Breonna Taylor and Ahmed Arbery and of course George Floyd. And I'm wondering if maybe we could begin today and we'll, we'll kind of go wherever you want to go, but if we might just talk for a few minutes about what, what this has been like for you to see uh, what's happening in the country and what experiences or feelings you might be having um, in the midst of all the different things that are happening. And I'll just kind of open it up and um, begin there maybe. Why don't we let Evelyn go first? She's the new. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Yes. That's great. Yes. That's great. <laughs> um, so it has, It's been difficult, um, I have to be honest. Um, it's been difficult processing everything that's been going on in the country, um, especially because this isn't new. This is something that has been going on and continues to happen every day. And I think that's one thing that we do need to realize. And while these specific cases have been in the news, this is a reality that African Americans face every single day, whether this makes news stories or not. Um, I've been engaging in a lot of conversations with friends who are like me, also African American, and my non-African American friends too, kind of gaining their perspective, seeing how they've been feeling about this, how they've been processing this. Um, I do have to say it's been mentally taxing, uh, just very overwhelming, everything hitting all at once. Um, I know it's been physically task taxing, sorry, 
for everybody who's been attending protests. It's, it's been a difficult experience. And I think having conversations like this has definitely helped in exploring our feelings and figuring out, okay, what is it that we can do to address these issues so we don't see something like this occur in the news again or without news coverage, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, similarly to what Evelyn has said, I feel like um, in light of all that's been happening in the news, it kind of is difficult because it gives people hope, but it also makes people wonder, can we actually achieve an end to racism when we are in the 21st century and, you know, hor horrific acts like this are taking place daily. Um, I think it's also important to note that some of these things go um, seen and some go unseen. Um, which makes you now question how bad really is it? I know that um, I also have conversations with my friends and like I mentioned a couple weeks ago, my closest friends aren't even like me. A lot of them practice different religions and come from different walks of life. So it's, it's interesting for them to reach out to me and tell me, you know, I feel your pain and I'm very sorry that this has been a battle for African Americans. But in my deepest of thoughts, it's not really a battle just for African Americans, but I think it's a battle for people of all different races who feel um, inferior, who feel suppressed. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like times like this unite people, but they also lead us in the wrong direction sometimes because a lot of people feel enraged and feel like the only solution is violence. And it kind of draws us back instead of pushing us forward. Mm -hmm. So I am equally saddened and equally um, struggling with how to register what's been happening. Mm -hmm. But I also feel like um, for some people, it's an eye opener. Thank you, Julia. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it was uh, emotionally exhausting mentally too, but emotionally exhausting. Because of all the three cases that happened, um, I think we first started coming to light about the Ahmad Aubrey in um, Georgia. Mm -hmm. He was going for jogging and then two, th now three men allegedly, mm -hmm. you know, kind of orchestrated, you know, citizen arrest and then led to his death, broad daylight. And then came um, George Floyd. And I think the same week, that's when the Central Park lady happened. Mm -hmm. And it felt like a confluent of all the big things we complain about all happened at one time. Mm -hmm. And in each case, I could totally see myself as the person in it. You know, so it was scary that things that we hear about, we read about, within a space of 60 days or so, high profile cases were up there happening. And I can easily put myself as one of those people going for jogging. Mm -hmm. And if you remember two weeks ago, I told you guys, I live in Cherry Hill. I live in one of the safest town you could possibly live in America, but yet I'm afraid to go jogging in my neighborhood. That is what I see in that young man going jogging, that somebody can mistake me doing something and without benefit of the doubt, it goes from zero to 100 within a space of three minutes. Meanwhile, I've spoken to my wife or to my Desmond that, oh, I'm going jogging. And five minutes, they get a call. He's gone. He can't comprehend that. Like, he was doing jogging. He's dead. What do you mean? Does it make sense? Same with Central Park. Going bird watching. So Cherry Hill, we have a lot of park where you can just walk around. And then you encounter somebody and so innocently that person goes from zero to hundred and then uses two key things that she knows very well that when you say a black man threatened me, a female voice, white female voice, the police come in there, any police, you're not getting benefit of the doubt. You are not getting benefit of the doubt. I mean, people get killed for even trying to pull a wallet, left alone you have been accused of being attacking somebody. 
So that is like your life hanging on a pendulum. And then um, George Floyd case, what made it so difficult is um, you literally watch human life being just sucked out, like broad daylight, like slowly, painfully being drawn out of somebody with regard, disregard for humanity. It doesn't matter if George Floyd was even black or white or whatever, green or yellow, but you don't do that to a human being. And I told this story that growing up in Ghana, as a young person coming of age, some of the things we do in the houses, most of the houses tend to have like a small hen coop where they have like chicken, ducks. Mm -hmm. So as you get to the age of 12 or so, you'll be the one responsible for go get the chicken and kill and slaughter the, kid, uh, the chicken or the duck so that they can use to make food. So it's, it's a pride. But even that, there's a, there's a way you go about it. You don't go grab the chicken. You have to be humane about it. You have to do it in a smile because if you do it wrong, your mom is going to slap you on the head. <laughs> you know, there's a way you treat animals. And as you get older, you go to the goat or the sheep with your older cousins or brothers. And even that, you don't pin a goat down like that. You do it in a humane fashion. So we don't even treat animals like that. And he was calling for his mom. Do you know the mom is already dead? His mom already died a year ago. So he knows very well for a man to be calling out his mom, knowing that his mom is dead. That means he can see his life just going away. And you know, sons and their mothers, we are attached to them. And he's calling for his mom. And this man, such nonchalant attitude, just comfortable, just sucking the life out of him in broad daylight. And people were telling him, it just didn't matter. It was just, it was just too much. A few times they were discussing, I was driving in between patients and I nearly cried because I could see I was emotional. I could feel goosebumps on me. And I was stopping the car, wait for five minutes just to gather myself before I see the patient because it was just too painful, just too painful. And I think as a white person, it's, it's so hard to understand that this is not just one incident, it's, it's, it's a cumulative impact of a history that you carry with you. Is that, is that a fair way to say that? Absolutely. So one of my friends growing up, not growing up in college, we were talking several years ago, an African-American man, a pastor. And uh, we had teenage children at the time. And we were talking, there had been some incident, I can't even tell you which one. And he said, um, do you ever worry about Caroline when she goes you know, into the car and, and drives somewhere? And I said, well, I worry, you know, because she's a new driver. He said, but do you ever worry, like, if she got stopped by a police officer? And I said, no. And he said, have you ever talked to her about what you should do if you got stopped by a police officer? I said, no. And he said, I've talked to every one of my children multiple times about what they should do if they get stopped. I've talked to them about how they should interact with white people in stores, with authority figures, teachers, doctors, that that's appropriate way. He said, have you ever talked with your daughter about that? I said, only to say to be respectful. He said, Greg, what I'm telling you is, is that we have a different narrative that we, I live with, that you live with, that you can't understand. And it, it, it's still hard for me, I have to tell you, to conceive what that's like. So he said there's an entire other layer of conversation that I have with my children about interaction with anybody when they leave our home. Yes, so uh, I was, you know, for the past two weeks, because of the series we're doing, I've been trying to read up a little bit. And um, there's a saying, there's a phrase that goes, there's the law and then there's reality when it comes to African-American. The law says this, but this is the reality for African-Americans. Mm -hmm. And going back to what you're saying, I think when you and I spoke the very first time, I was telling you the way I was brought up and I know the way every parent raises a child is to be respectful of anybody you meet, stranger, somebody you know, um, respectful. So 
when you give it respect, even like a kid, an older person, your age mate, mm -hmm. when you go out, you don't have to do anything different because it's a human being you interact with respectful. But you're right. When as a growing up African American as a black person, I have to overdo it. I have to think. I have to calculate every move, everything. And I'm saying to myself, why does it have to be so? Because in my workplace, I respect the housekeepers, my nurses, everybody. I treat everybody with respect. But then when you meet an officer, you know, or when you go out and something happens, you have to actually pause. And you may not see it because it's something ingrained in us. You pause and your brain within a, a second or two process, okay, now this is what I need to do. And you become almost like a subservient to the person. Yes, sir. Sorry. Basically, you become almost subservient just to preserve your life. That's the, that's, the, that's the key thing so that you can live to see another day or maybe live to see the next hour or two. That's the bottom line. And it's very disheartening because this isn't an issue that we just face as adults. Um, as African-Americans, we have these difficult conversations with our parents from a young age. And it's heartbreaking um, thinking about Julia and I, like our, our younger brother too. You know, it'll be really cold in the winter, for example, everybody will have their gloves on, their scarves, their hats, but we'll tell our brother or our parents will tell our brother, you know, if you're going inside of the store, if you're going somewhere, make sure you take your hat off so that you don't look suspicious, for example. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's difficult having these conversations, um, especially at a young age, because, you know, you want kids to be kids for as long as possible. And there are children who have the luxury of preserving that innocence. Whereas for us, you know, as soon as we can start walking, as soon as we start interacting with people going to school, it's like little conversations, they build up more and more and more starting from a young age. So it kind of takes away from us really being able to just be kids and kind of look at the world like the world is a good place, being optimistic about that. We kind of have that ingrained from a young age. Okay you are different from a lot of your peers. Your peers might be able to do this, but this is what you should do, starting at like age six, for example. Wow. Yeah, um, I remember um, a couple weeks ago, um, my brother wanted to participate in graduation pictures because he just graduated from um, high school. Mm -hmm. And you know, they had all the seniors gathering at um, one of the elementary schools. And um, it was kind of like an evening event. So my mom interrogated him, like, what time does it start? What time does it end? You know, and she said, you have to be back at this time. And so, of course, when my brother came home, people were still congregating and taking pictures. But my mom had said, you know, by this time of night, you need to be in the house. And he, he told me, you know, something was bothering me while I was driving, and I couldn't figure it out till now. And what was bothering me is the fact that my friends are still there, you know, taking pictures, laughing, enjoying, but I have to come home. My festivities have to conclude earlier because at a certain time, it becomes very risky for him to be, you know, out there. And I felt so bad and so helpless because it wasn't the type of situation where all you have to do is, you know, click one button and everything transforms. It was one of those things where I had to be very apologetic, but I didn't know what to do to kind of ease that pain and promise him of a better solution because it's not, it's not one person's fight. It's really everybody's. So just to give a little historic background, let me give a vivid case of what we're talking about. Uh, Emmett Till. Yes. Emmett Till was 12, 13 years old, lives in Chicago, went to Mississippi or so, I think one of the Southern states to visit his uh, uncle or grand uncle or so mm -hmm. with his cousin, uh, 12 year old free spirit went to a local grocery store and the store owner and the wife uh, Caucasian and him being the kid, 12 year old, if you read the history or if you listen, either he made a whistle, some kind of gesture to the lady. 
he actually um, had a lisp. I was reading about that in one of my classes. So the whistle, like the cat calling, but it was actually a lisp. So it wasn't something that he could help, which was the most heartbreaking part about the situation. Yeah. And um, that was it. That's his crime. Two days, a day or so later, they came for him in his house. And we all know the rest is history. Mm. You know, uh, so, and I mean, that's a, a very graphic one and you can tell. And obviously that's about 50 years ago or so, but it tells you it's woven into the fabric. The elements are still there. Now, nobody, will, well, with George Floyd case, you can't say that, but it can be so much blatant in your face that like going to grab somebody from the house and then go mutilate him and kill him that way. It's, it's, it's I don't think you can, you might see it, but then, in the, then again, I could be wrong because in a way, somehow the, the system back then was emboldened them to do that in your face. Now it's a little bit subtle in a way, but you know, most likely they do it. The case, the justice system delays. I think that's one of the things, the justice system delays in getting them when they do the case become almost close to a nonsense case but it gets watered down so it's like you want to go back to the good old bible days an eye for an eye sometimes that's how you feel an eye for an eye or the george floyd case it's like you know what why are we wasting our time with the justice system why don't we just put the cup down and just put on the knee on the neck for eight eight to forty uh, eight point four five six seconds i mean minutes and 46 seconds and see how he will survive i mean we shouldn't waste time with the justice system. We saw what he did. That was fine with him. Let me do the same thing to him and see if it's fine. I mean, sometimes you feel like we don't need to waste our time. Why don't we do the, the same, an eye for an eye? Let's see if that is nice. You know, that's when emotions start boiling up and the anger comes in. And sometimes, I mean, for me, it's, but you have to think about generations. This is affecting them. So that's why, it's very interesting to get the story from people from different generations or different ancestral line because I came here 22 years ago. So can you imagine somebody who's five, six generation African-American where their great, great, great grandparents were slaves, born into it. And so it's woven into their DNA, their anger, their, the, um, how they feel about the system. So the least then it triggers that anger where they feel they are not considered as human beings because that's how he knows his grandparents. Great grandparents have been treated and it's just one of them. Many years ago, I was in seminary in the 90s and I was leaving a Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, service of commemoration of Dr. King. And um, I was walking out with a, an acquaintance and as we walked out, he was very emotional and African-American man and I said, he said, are you okay? And, and he was, it became clear he was very angry. And uh, he said, you know, I, civil rights is one thing. I'm still not over slavery. So don't ask me to, to, to come to terms with civil rights. I'm still trying to process what happened to my ancestors 150 years ago. And so, I, again, I think this thing of, of the history that is still an ever-present reality is part of what I'm trying to listen to and, and, and try to take in um, to just try to understand. And again, I know this place is, I, I, I find it as, as white folk, I think it's hard because I wanna be part of helping us move forward as a nation. Um, but if I say, well, this is what we should do, then it's, it's pretty tricky, right? Then it's, well, it's just one more white person saying, this is what we all should do. On the other hand, if I say to you, as my black sisters and brothers, help us, you who are hurting, I'm now saying to you, but please help me. But I've decided if I have to choose between the former or the latter, I have to go with the latter because I want us to be colleagues and work together. And I need to hear from, from African Americans about what are the steps we can do. Um, or what are practical ways? And part of what we want to do, you know, I said several weeks ago to the, to the congregation, I want to pray, I want to listen, and I want to act. Um, with, with that in mind, I just, I do want to say that I know several people had questions, and there is a chat box that you can send questions to, and we will try to take um, 
uh, some time for that. Um, but, but because we, you know, I, I have to listen because I think that's the way forward so we can work together. But I also just listened to you again today for me to, to ask you to tell me means more pain. Um, but I, I don't know a way forward for us as white folk and black folk together, except to, for us to listen and hopefully be changed and be able to use our power together to bring change, especially as Christians. Um, Quincy, go ahead. Uh, Juliet, do you care to start um, you know, sharing or addressing that? Yes, um, thank you. I, I've always had this theory that um, you know, when you're very comfortable in life, it's nice you're complacent, but it doesn't mean you're at the best place. And so I always thought to myself, the next thing after being comfortable is entering like this intermediate phase of difficulty where you're wrestling with, you know, a certain problem or a certain challenge. But then after overcoming that intermediate phase of challenge and difficulty, you enter a new level of comfortability. And it's a better level than the previous one. And so I say that because the first time I engaged in this town hall meeting, I never realized how difficult it would be to talk about racism because for me, it's, it's every day and it's been my entire life. So I thought, okay, how, how bad can it be to you know, speak for one hour about this? But of course, it became clear to me that this conversation is very raw and hits a very deep place. And that's why I think it's important that even though it's uncomfortable and even though it's um, difficult for some people, both black and white to engage, I think it's one of the only ways we are able to recognize the problem, acknowledge the problem and try to work and coexist with the problem. I know that it seems as though sometimes we prefer to silence the things that haunt us because it's easier to pretend like they're not there. But Part of our intermediate challenge is coexisting with this problem and looking for ways to, to just um, surmount them. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think my, if I were to give one solution to the racism, I would say we need to be very careful and attentive in the way we address children. Mm -hmm. I think the only way the cycle continues is if we pass on our ways to the next generation. And I've observed this on elementary school level and just like middle school level, how children are being forged by, you know, their parents' beliefs to propagate this notion of racism. And it's exactly why people at a young age, as young as five or six, begin to alienate people and recognize those who are different from them. And so my biggest thing is we need to start instilling this in our younger ones and not just by default tell them our old ways. We need to give them the chance and ability to discern, you know, what's right and what is wrong. Otherwise the cycle will inevitably continue. That's, that's always been my thought um, in, in terms of a solution, but I know it's not the only solution. And I know it's a challenging one because parents and adult figures will inevitably impart their beliefs on their offspring or their younger ones. That's, it's inevitable, but I think that's where it really starts. I agree with um, my sister. I think one thing we need to realize is that we need to embrace these uncomfortable situations, these uncomfortable conversations, because, you know, while we're having this town hall meeting for an hour, I know it is difficult to talk about these situations, but from our point of view, this is something that this uncomfortable, this, this is what we live with 24 hours in a day, seven days a week. And I think, especially for the sake of the younger generation, we need to be ready to just jump right in in a way that they'll understand. Um, we're in a unique situation now that we have the power of social media, we have the power of media in general, um, especially reaching younger generations. That could absolutely be a tool in talking to them. I know there is, I heard this on the news a couple of weeks ago. There was a little bit of controversy because Nickelodeon, I believe, they took like a eight minute, 46 second pause um, 
from their regular scheduled programming, just like a moment of silence for George Floyd. And it welcomed discussion between kids and their parents, like, okay, what was this? what was this eight minutes and 46 seconds for what exactly was this situation you know there are definitely ways that it doesn't have to feel so heavy and uncomfortable in having these conversations but we can't just ignore these issues we need to embrace okay this is uncomfortable but this needs to be said and done because this is the only way that things will actually change okay so i would do very well not to be um I'll be slightly philosophical because I've been doing a lot of thinking and reading. Uh, Reverend knows I'm not philosophical, I'm just medical. <laughs> um, and I, I've seen the questions that was sent, I'm actually looking at it now reading, but uh, I appreciate that. Before I, I, I uh, give my thoughts, um, I'd like to say thank you to everybody. Um, since our last meeting, I did receive a few emails and um, cards to thank me and also showing the appreciation. I actually am saying thank you uh, for listening and also having your family listen to us. And uh, I think that is the beginning of uh, us working on this problem. I think um, I'll, I'll make a quote uh, by Viktor Frankl. I hope I have the name right. And I think he said, what makes a human different from animals is the ability for us to have control over our minds and thoughts. Um, I remember when I spoke to Reverend a month ago when we started talking, I said something at the, the dichotomy of a human being. The human being is capable of doing great and wonderful things, going to the moon, to space. I mean, look at the structures we build, the things we do. And yet human beings, you can literally say the same human being is capable of doing so much evil. So it's a choice. We have to make that choice. You have to look in your heart and mind. It's a battle of the heart and mind and soul. You have to sit down and look into yourself, who you are, and make that choice that going forward, I'll be more active instead of passive. Mm -hmm. I think uh, to my... Caucasian friends, uh, white friends, you were not, you didn't call slavery, you didn't do it. You were born into the system. Don't feel bad about it, but it's our history. Mm -hmm. You have to own to your history. You have to, you know, take it as part of your history. Mm -hmm. And then going forward, what are we doing about history? So the first thing I'll say is, you, the individual, have to, in terms of heart and soul, tell yourself that, I'm going to try and make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. But knowing that this is not a generational thing. Mm -hmm. It starts with you. It starts with the younger generation and the generation after that. This was not gonna be solved in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. Mm -hmm. But with each passing generation, we can make it better. Mm -hmm. um, so it starts by also knowing our history. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a saying that whoever owns the history controls the future. It sounds counterintuitive mm -hmm. because how we write history is what the future generations will read or will see and will carry forward. So if we water down the history of America, the history of slavery, the history of segregation, Jim Crow, civil war, that is the mindset people who will come after will read. If we glorify it, whichever way it is, that is what will be propagated 100 years from now, 200 years from now, and that's what has happened. Mm -hmm. So we need to arm ourselves with history. So start with education mm -hmm. and history. Mm -hmm. And the materials to know about the history of America is all over, it's around us. But we just have to make open our mind and be active about it. Museums are one way to start. Because of technology, most of the books, whether good or bad, you can find them online in the library. Even though you can't go to library, I think most of the libraries now have some kind of portal where you can access books and stuff. You have to feed the mind. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about it as a medical doctor, how to best explain it. Mm -hmm. As a doctor, when somebody comes to me, they have a problem. So America has a problem, America comes to me. But when you come and ask you, I always do, what is the history of present illness? I want to know your history, when did this start? What symptoms? I need to know the history of your complaint that you're telling me. 
in order for me to recognize patterns, see it so that I can have a diagnosis like, oh, this is the most likely cause X, Y, and Z. That way I can formulate a plan on how to take it, how to manage you or how to cure it or how to make it better. So I'm telling you, in order to move forward, it's not a one day thing, a one month thing or a one year thing. Mm -hmm. We need to go back, mm -hmm. look at our history, know the history, the true history of America. Mm -hmm. I'm saying this because during my research and reading, I came across a group called United Daughters of Confederacy. They did a very good job of what the world has become now, what America has become now. This group was from 18, let me see my little history so I don't get wrong. 1890, the height of their uh, time was 1894 to right after the Second World War. And these are daughters and granddaughters of Confederate soldiers. And they played a huge role in the monuments that was erected, what was written, what the textbooks, education. So it also, um, I will address the question of Cherry Hill Board because I think this answer kind of touches on the two questions that are sent to us. So knowing the history and education is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Julia touched base on mothers and children. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sexist, but this is actually a tribute to mothers and to women. Mothers are the people who carry babies for nine months, they're about, they nest the children, they raise the children before the fathers we come in. No disrespect to fathers, I'm gonna be one, but mothers have a critical role in the upbringing of a child what they influence a child, what a child sees, they eat and absorb. The child brain is like a sponge and it takes in a lot of information, not just verbally, but nonverbal cues. We pick up a lot. So what are you watching? What are you talking to your friend? You may not think the child is not knowing, but they see it. They see your body actions to people around you and they pick up those cues. Mm -hmm. So as mothers, women, we hold a strong position how we move forward. So I put the challenge to mothers, to the women, to the younger, because you are the one going to bear the next generation and after that and after that. And even if you look at history, they propagate the notion of white superiority or segregation because the white man told the white woman, you are, you know, put her on a pedestal and nobody compares to you. And she believed it. So she didn't question the husband or the man, what he's doing to other people because she's been told she's up there. So she was comfortable. But as a wife and as a mother, you have the ear of, your, of the man at the end of the day. You can talk to him. Uh, I'll tell you a little story. My wife and I, we do get a little arguments. She gets mad at me because she said, I don't listen to her. It's like, she told me something like, she, I behave like she hasn't put thought to it. But what she doesn't know is, yes, she talks to me. I may have my opinion, but she doesn't know I sit back and think of what she told me. And I do make adjustment, but she wants me to change my mind right there when she says it. My, my point is there's a power of persuasion. Uh, there's a saying, I don't know which culture, the man is the head of the house, but the woman is the neck. The neck controls the head. My big fat Greek wedding. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Even though we're not going to use a uh, windsaw, you know, the father like, <laughs> I mean, light saw, windsaw, so like, but the point is, women has a bigger role in shaping the future and how we go forward. No disrespect to men. Women, if you go to most primary schools, local board, school education, most women are on the board of education. Local government, a lot of women are in local governments. And it starts from there. We can make, we, this, this is where you can make great impact. But like I said, it starts from the heart and mind and soul. And then knowing the right history, and once you know the right history, you arm yourself with that, knowing that you're gonna pass it on. You're gonna be active about it and pass it on. So I will end, I mean, I'll stop at this point. Well, you're referring to, I don't, I'm not sure all of, all of our participants can see the question, but one of the questions we received is, uh, the Cherry Hill School Board uh, has asked that a black history curriculum be provided for all students. And the question is, uh, what do you think should be included in that instruction? And maybe uh, Evelyn and Juliet, your children of that of that curriculum of that school system, at least. Um, do you have some thoughts uh, along with Kwesi, what he said? Absolutely. Uh, so 
some of you may or may not know, but I was also, one of my majors here at Pitt was Africana Studies. So I was able to get um, a unique perspective and really think about this question. Uh, one thing that I will say that the Cherry Hill Board can absolutely improve on is when we talk about African American history, Black history, we kind of do the same thing every year where we spend one week in February during Black History Month and we talk about slavery, we talk about Rosa Parks, we talk about Dr. King and then move on. I think that's part of the problem because there is so much more to Black history than I guess those three topics that we touch on again and again and again every single year from kindergarten up until 12th grade. And it's important that we realize that Black history is not just limited to the period of the 1960s. Black history is history. So I feel as if the Cherry Hill Board can do a better job when creating this curriculum to recognize, okay, so-and-so happened. We talk about the period before Common Era, after Common Era, how has Black history been incorporated into this? How can we look through that perspective and really ingrain Black history into all of the history that we learn about in classes, not just a unit on the 1960s that we talk about for a couple of weeks? Another thing, um, so one of my professors from my Intro to Africana Studies class, he asked us a question one day, and he told us to name some classical artists. Um, and there's like a hundred of us in the class. So we came up with a few common names. We're raising our hands saying, okay, Beethoven, Tchaikovsky, for example. And then he stood and he laughed at us and he's like, okay, that's it. That's all you guys are talking about. Like, okay, those are classical European artists, but what about classical African music, classical South American music? And I think that's part of how we've been taught from a young age of almost like a, I think tunnel vision is almost the best way to put it. Like we've been taught history, we've been taught lessons through one lens without really considering other points of view. So that's one thing that we can definitely improve on as well, um, learning history through other points of view, not just the Eurocentric point of view because all of these cultures have in one way or in multiple ways have played major roles in American history, our history, where this country is today. So being able to recognize that we need to look at lessons in history through other points of view is another way that we can change minds, change perspectives, and really engage in these conversations, not just when something happens in the news, if that makes sense. So really ingraining these lessons throughout and not just within a two week period. And even feasible things like summer reading assignments, for example. Um, I was talking to a friend who was looking at the same thing in her school district in Pennsylvania too, like what the district is planning on doing to address these issues and really reach the younger kids. And there have been some questions of, okay, if we incorporate Black history, African American history, is that going to be disruptive to lesson plans, things that have already been decided that students absolutely need to learn. We need to realize that while those lesson plans are important, we need to be able to incorporate other information as well, because if we keep on doing the same thing, nothing is going to change. So even if it's something small like incorporating artists, or sorry, authors from other backgrounds in summer reading assignments and hopefully getting that into the regular school year curriculum, that could be a good start. Sorry, I know this was, <laughs> it was all a lot, but. That's good. No, that's, 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 what, that's what we're here for. We were trying, we're, you know, that was one of the first questions we received was, um, um, and I, I, I know the person who sent this question, um, um, who is an older white man in our congregation. And he, you know, he's very concerned about what can he do, what can I do to help? And his question is, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to, I'm sure there are many things you would like to see, but can you name two specific actions you would like white people to do 
that you feel would bring black and white people together to a greater level of equality and social justice. And so part of what you're already talking about is just widening the, the diversity of the historic narrative so that it includes people of color. So, right, that's just a basic, that would be a great thing if education had multiple stories of multiple races of not just the Eurocentric narrative. But can I can I, can I springboard off of that and just say, are there other things that you might say to this member about specific things that, Kwesi, you have something? Oh, I want Juliet to say that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I I really do appreciate that question because it already tells me that you know, in order for the problem to be resolved, we do need to do something. We can't just passively hope, wish, and you know. Um, think that the problem will solve itself. I think um, in addition to what we've all come to a consensus on, like being very careful in how we talk to the next generation, I think another thing we have to understand is um, there is a specific reason why um, racism exists. And in, in my opinion, from what I've observed, I feel like one of those reasons is that by suppressing someone else or by limiting someone else, it gives us a false sense of authority and power. I feel like one of the ways in which we combat that um, false perception is by asking ourselves, do we really need to um, give someone an unfair outlook or give someone like an unfair treatment because it will make ourselves feel better? When in reality, if we want to live a truthful life and an honest life, we have to understand that that involves treating people who may not be like us just the same. You know, I was talking to my mom, who's a nurse, and um, asking her how I can prepare for this. She said, you have to bring up the point that when God created every single one of his children, he put a, a heart in everyone's um, thoracic cavity. He put lungs. He put kidneys. He put everything that every other person has. And so anatomically, we are the same. And so the next question is, why then do we treat each other differently? And unless we can come up with an actual reason, a justifiable reason, I think that's enough to let us know that this whole notion of racism is, is kind of trivial and unneeded. I think one thing that we can do to push ourselves in the forward direction is, do not be afraid to hold these conversations. Do not be weary and do not feel like you need to fall back into your comfortable you know, blanket of um, security. Mm -hmm. You have to tell yourself, you know, change doesn't come from being passive and hoping and wishing. You know, we, 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 we look at all these inventions in this world, airplanes, buildings, and that didn't just arise from the sky and it didn't just arise from the ground. People had to think about it, deliberate, and be very patient and dedicated. I think the first thing we need is to, first of all, acknowledge the fact that this is our problem and that we do have an intention to solve this problem because that intention will inspire a drive that will have us continuously working towards a solution to that problem. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's what we really need to do. We really need to, first of all, come back into ourselves and ask ourselves, do we really want to solve this problem? And if we do, how can we at least try our best to fight maybe the ideas we've already had, the preconceived notions we've had in our head, how we can fight those and welcome new ideas, ones that may be contrary to what we believe, but in fact helpful to inspire new beliefs and new ideals and outlooks for everybody else. So I just want to take a moment to, to let you know, because I, I, I don't know what you're able to see. I know the panelists, but we have people from our congregation saying that this is a very slow process and I couldn't do what all of you are doing and I'm grateful. Thank you for the courage you've shown this morning. Heartfelt and eloquent, very grateful for what you've given to us. Um, so I think I want to say that part of what we're doing, this, this is also part of the, the steps of, of accomplishing what we're hoping for. Um, you, you, you sharing with us and hopefully all of us listening um, I also want to take the opportunity before we end today to say that we will continue uh, to have various forums, 
I, I think Kwesi and I are hoping uh, with others in the, in the session of elders to have these kind of town hall meetings with going different directions. And topics, um, yeah. That different topics. Put, yeah, within racism, yeah. And then also uh, uh, the Mission and Outreach uh, Committee and the Adult Ministries Committee are also working on um, some other kinds of events that we can have uh, in this time of a virtual world. Um, but we are, we are working toward that. Um, oh, I just, oh, so someone is saying that they work in educational curriculum uh, at the educational testing service. Um, and perhaps one of the things would be to have guest speakers coming to schools. Um, so to I, was talk gonna, about I was going to, I was going to also hit on that. So in terms of the Cherry Hole School Board, things they can do. So first of all, I know America, we came out with February Black History Month. I think it should never be like that. Black history should be part of American history. So mm -hmm. every month, every week, there should be elements of it in our teaching and every day. So as a nation or as Cherry Hole Board, we can say, you know what, we can do better. We are doing beyond Black History Month, February. Mm -hmm. We are going to incorporate you know, uh, book reading series for students within the mo every month of the year as mm -hmm. part of our curriculum. So mm -hmm. let's get over Black History Month where they spend, let's do that. Mm -hmm. I also think we can also have the lecture series that uh, the gentleman mentioned. That's something I thought that once a month, you know, it can be every week, but at least once a month, have uh, somebody have almost a panel. It could be like a 30 minutes topic and then a panel talk and then open Q and A. We have, uh, I think there are auditoriums on the Cherry Hill schools where we can have that. So once a month. And our advice that if we decide to go that way, let's stay away from politicians or very prominent people who are already known because quote unquote, they may have People may have a preconceived notion or perception of them. Mm -hmm. I think this type we're doing where it's quote unquote, the people who live within our community that we can relate to, mm -hmm. they're not coming off quote unquote with an agenda or political agenda. It mm -hmm. feels raw, it feels intimate. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's like us sitting and having a beer or tea or just sitting at, uh, under a tree, just having a chat. So let's make sure, because you'll find people within our community who have the background, who have the experience and can share it and can even do a little homework to present to us. Mm -hmm. you know, so yes, I'm actually in favor of that, that it could be once a month for the township or the parents of the students or every student mm -hmm. coming in Cherry Hill East and West, the middle school. So this can be done once a month for each one of them. Uh, and then let's scratch the Black History Month. I think we can do way better than that. You know, there are topics that definitely like uh, the Black Wall Street in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Emmett Till, um, the soldiers in World War, uh, Black so to the Tuskegee Airmen, um, the syphilis case, um, you know, Black. There's so much that if you take, you can't even fit in each day of the, of, of the year, 365. But so that means it's there. Like I said, the materials are there. They're right in our face. It's, it's right there. Trust me. It's mm -hmm. only... You have to be proactive. You have to want it. Like Juliet say, we have to be active. They are there. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go on vacation, oh, right now, Corona due to Corona, I would like to think every major city in America has some kind of African-American museum. Mm -hmm. You know, at least from here to Washington, D.C. is about three hours. The Smithsonian, there's an African-American museum. I know there's one in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. We can start with those things. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's Corona time, but let's say when things are sort of back, we can start educating ourselves. Uh, even our travels, every now and then, there are, there are decent, nice places in the continent of Africa that you can go. You know, you can demystify things yourself instead of you reading or hearing the, the media stuff. Go there yourself, see it for yourself. I'm not saying everybody should go, but if you can make it, take that trip. Um, you may have African-American, I mean, uh, friends from Africa, get to know them better. Most of them, I like to think every couple of years, they do go visit family at home. Talk to them about it. Say, you know what? Do you mind if I can join you maybe next two years when you're going, we can plan? They will love you. They'll feed you. You'll put on weight. 
<laughs> and I don't need to go. Uh, but, but then again, you will see with your own eyes what the people are, the culture is, like the issues they have. Everybody have issues. You get to know firsthand experience. And you'll be very surprised that when you go to Ghana or in most African nations, you see a lot of Europeans just walking about. People think it's dangerous. I tell people I feel much safer, not because I was born and raised there, but in terms of thinking that somebody's going to shoot me a policeman. The policeman in Ghana, <laughs> all right. So back to my original point. I think uh, Cherry Hope Board, we can do what the nation is doing. We can say, you know what? African-American history is part of American history. We can do better. We can incorporate it from January 1st to December 31st. We can have books we can read. We can have, you know, subjects in once a week, a subject in the class. There's so much material we can work on. Uh, there were African-Americans that was part of the Revolutionary War when the British fighting for independence. Some of them fought on the British side. Some fought, uh, I mean, fought on the American side. We need to know about that. Uh, World War I, World War II. I mean, there's so much inventors. There are a lot of inventors who are African-Americans. We don't know about them. You know, um, so there's so, like, it comes to business, science, art. You know, uh, I would like to think most of our young uh, kids, you know, white kids, they love, uh, you know, hip-hop, rap and stuff. They do. They won't tell you, but they do. Look at their their uh, YouTube music list or their phone go through and you'll be surprised. They enjoy it. What do they enjoy about it? Talk about it. See it. You know, there's something in it, you know, that connects with them and stuff. You know, so I think uh, it has to be an active, a uh, an active thing. And so um, I think we can start with that place. Um, in a few years time, hopefully my son will be starting school. So maybe I might be on the board. I will try to be on one of the boards and stuff. Uh, but I think we can start from there. And like I said earlier, mothers have a bigger role to play. Um, I don't know the makeup of the board, but when I do the local elections and I'm voting, I see a lot of the local elections, female names are on the list there. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was touching on mothers, touching mm -hmm. on our sisters, our aunties, our grandmothers. We are the one making decisions on the local government level, local town level. And we have a much bigger impact to shape the present and the future. Like I said, whoever controls the history controls the future. So we need to reclaim our history, the true history of America. It's painful, but that's who we are. Let me, I know time is coming. Let me end with one thing. Yes. Every four years, we see the, the glory or the beauty of America, the Olympic Games. I would like to think in modern Olympics, America has always come on top every Olympic Games. And during the Olympic Games, you see the diversity in different disciplines of sports. And America dominates because different people, different backgrounds come with their talent to the table. They're allowed to flourish. And we are happy because at the end of the day, America is on top. So imagine if we can give equality, we can open up to everybody and every kid can fulfill their potential because these kids in the inner city who are disadvantaged from the get-go, they have so much potential in them, but they can't bring it out because they're trying to survive. If you're surviving, you can't improve your potential because you're thinking of how to survive. But if you have that peace of mind to grow that God-given potential, then you do wonderful things. And that's the work we want to be about is helping everyone reach their potential. One last thing, somebody said this is a slow process. This process cannot, I mean, yes, there's some things you want legislatures to make certain changes and that, but remember I said there's the law and there's the reality. Yes, I want them to change the law, but who is implementing the reality of life? It comes from you and I, it's the mind. I mean, think about it, after the Civil War, the Emancipation Proclamation, it didn't end everything. It still went on for a long time before a little changes. So the law is written, but the reality of it is the heart and mind of the people. And we're dealing with human beings. It's not going to change overnight. No. It's painful. I want it to change overnight, but I'm being realistic here. Mm -hmm. So as much as I want it to be very fast, I have to recognize that we're dealing with the hearts and mind. And it's not, and we are human beings, the dichotomy of human being. It's not that simple.
Right, but there's an ancient, an ancient Chinese proverb that says that the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Well, it's Chinese, huh? So we, so we, Li Po, I think, the poet Li Po. But anyway, we, we take these steps. And I want to say thank you. We continue to get thank you uh, texts and emails for all that you've offered today. Um, I think uh, perhaps in light of all that you've said, uh, Jeff Weaver said last time and wanted to say again this time that for him, uh, the, it's three A's, awareness, acknowledgement, action. And that for many people, there's just not awareness. So a lot of what you've been talking about today is just helping people grow and be, become educated, become aware, um, and then acknowledge. I mean, this is, this is an important part of, of, of my own personal hard work. And I think a lot of my brothers and sisters who are white acknowledging the reality. Um, and then we're able to act. Um, so I want to say thank you. I, I do, I've been asked to say another suggestion has been, could we have a one book, one church, um, so that we suggest a book um, and that we all, whoever would like to read that together, uh, so that another step in our becoming um, more aware and, and more educated. So maybe that's a possibility. We will continue to think about these things. I want to invite all of you who participate today uh, to be part of the 24-hour prayer vigil, which will be next Friday and Saturday, the third and fourth. Uh, we need to pray for our nation and for our church. And so this is an opportunity. You can sign up at the website. I want to say thank you so much to Evelyn and Julieta Corey and Dr. Kwesi Manu for being with us today. Um, and we hope that we will be able to have Jeff Weaver here at a, a future time. Um, with your permission, I will say a quick prayer and uh, we will say um, till the next time. Thank you all. Let us pray. Help us, O oh God, that we might learn. And then in that learning, we might be changed. And from that change, we might serve our neighbors because we have known your great love in Jesus Christ. So this we ask in his holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. And thank you all for joining us.